some more fundamental issues, whether or not broadband is a business, whether or not it should be a monopoly or not a monopoly. And I think Hollywood is a, is a major force in this, in this mix. So I've already stated this, that no matter what the policy field may be, there are things that are more fundamental to whether or not the business will be successful, either broadband or some Hollywood business relating to broadband, that has to do with whether or not the technologi technology is sustainable economically, uh, whether it'll work for the functionality. So today we don't see video over the internet very much because it basically doesn't, for the most part, it doesn't really work. It may actually work over a DSL link, but there's a nice paper by uh, Jay Kim, who was with Paul Kagan and Associates, who's now out at Sandler Capital, that talks about the economics of the video delivery serving it up. It's not, uh, not that cheap. <laughs> One of the interesting analogies with respect to whether or not broadband is a business goes back to the early to mid 1800s where uh, it became clear that transportation and road technology could be improved. And one of the alternatives that was proposed and implemented and for which there was a huge boom was laying wooden planks next to one another on top of the dirt. And it off obviously offered much greater convenience and speed of travel. And it wasn't wrong that, that advanced road technology was, was the right answer, but the specific implementations turned out that argued that there'd be 13, 12 to 15 year lifetimes of these roads. Well, the boom lasted for three or four years until they found out that the roads only lasted three or four years. And so the return on investment wasn't present. So, I think this is an important historical fact and event to consider because here we are, broadband, everybody agrees it's going to be the future. But then you look at it and you say, well, you know, we've kind of run out of gas. We spent all this money. There's not profitability. Is there something maybe wrong with the, the implementation? And this is the one that I've already jumped the gun on, but you know, the business models are you either you invest it and you get your returns, or you invest it and you go bankrupt and get the returns. That's number two, we capitalized. Third is absent being able to make a business out of either of those former ones, is the government gets involved and we pay for things because we, we believe they have secondary and tertiary benefits that are not immediately manifestable, like police and fire and you know, roadways and whatnot. Um, but if you don't have one, two, or three, what happens? It goes away. So. I think it's important to think about these things because we're at that point now where uh, commercial investment is waning and there's a chance that the government will be stepping in. They need to make the right decisions. What evidence is there that SBC isn't making money on DSL? Uh, well, I think it's... Just, just wanted to ask. Yeah, that's a good question. and Because and I think they are making money on DSL. Yeah. Well, there are, there are different sources of data that I've used to actually look at these types of, types of numbers. If you look at all the independent broadband type of operations and you look at their um, 10Ks, you don't find good pictures in terms of their net cash flows. Uh, it's all kind of cash going out the door. You're and talking you about could say, well, that's the investment. You're things. talking about COVAD and those guys? COVAD, North Point. I'm okay. talking about SBC. Yeah. So SBC, you're not going to be able to break out the numbers as easily. I understand and that. I'm just so asking what, I don't, I don't what the evidence is. I don't think that you necessarily have direct evidence of that. Um, Earthlink, you can go and take a look at their 10 case and you can see where they've made uh, cautions about the fact that broadband costs them a lot more in bandwidth to deploy. And uh, you can see... Well, that's partly because they're paying money to the phone company. Right. So, I mean, that's why I'm asking Well, that, that goes back to the monopoly, no, not monopoly argument. Um, but just because SBC probably is in the best position to make money does not mean that they can't make money. And just because there isn't evidence that they aren't making money doesn't mean that they aren't making money. Or that they are making money. I'm not asking if they are or they aren't. I'm just asking what the evidence is. Yeah. There's an indirect way of telling that they must be making some money. And that is if you go and take a look at the investment in uh, the growth of edge switches, which yes. are used to feed uh, DSL concentration. That turns out to be the growth market for semiconductors right now is in pri providing um, OC3, OC12 uh, upgrades uh, for that. So it's, it's, I think pretty much the argument made a bit of a falsehood so as to 
write off a huge amount of expenses in terms of, uh, of uh, labor for inept uh, uh, deployments uh, by linemen that weren't even trained. Uh, I mean, there's some amazing stories uh, from Koban about that, of literally thousands of hours spent by personnel to set up a single DSL line. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you write that off over a long period of time, it's a big lump of money. Uh, and so if you just take a look at things in terms of actual cost and investment in new uh, uh, infrastructure, I think that's an adequate uh, a way of seeing, it. yeah, there's probably a business in it, although it may not be the best business as witness Microsoft exiting uh, recently uh, from wanting to do the an ISP. Yeah, I think that's one of those questions that's not going to be easy to answer. Over time, there will be more and more history. I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just looking for something that has some data rather than a statement that people aren't making money. Oh, well, that's a good point. Um, the, the people that aren't making money are the ones that you can identify. SBC, it's a question. I can't say that they aren't, but they are they aren't. My, my suspicion is that, that, that they may not be. I think you can kind of tell where SBC is at in that they are, they've kind of changed their focus from being purely the, you know, the transport part of it, and now they're calling their DSL service you know, SBC slash or DSL slash Yahoo or whatever its name is. So you know, they're, they're putting the element of content in it. I think that's where they probably expect to make their money is by potentially selling you content rather than they just being the more money than just selling DSL. Right. I agree with that. Yeah. And in fact, that's where the paradigm shift is coming right now. And that is that uh, maybe they're willing to surrender uh, the actual internet service providing uh, to the, to the uh, uh, telcos again. Uh, and then uh, couple that with the content provider. I think you get a, uh, there's, there's a related topic of structural separation, which has been a policy topic. And I, I've always been a little bit confused by it because to me, if you're not making money off of selling it, having a bunch of other people sell it for you in competition doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> make it any better. The, the, the argument for structural separation, I guess has gone back and forth in Japan as well as here. And it's sort of saying, to me it says that there will be the people that will own the infrastructure and the people that will market it, kind of an oversimplification of it. And, uh, and some of the folks that are the Wall Street analysts have argued, well, if you're not making money off of, off of the infrastructure itself, then you have to go down the value chain and provide value-added services. But I think that's really questionable if, you know, if your history is being a, a carrier. You, know, you really should be able to make money as a carrier. And whether or not SBC is making money, I, I would love to find out more details on. They have had a project pronto of $2 billion, $6 billion, something rolled out that they far curtailed before they really reached the end point. And it may have been through their regulatory posturing in order to get the un unbundled network elements to, to get the reconsolidation of power that they, that they didn't deploy that more aggressively. But it does speak to maybe that the, the things weren't quite as uh, ideal as it is as they wish they were. But I, so I just, I just want to pose the question, that maybe nobody is making money, including SBC, and if, if so, you know, what, what does that pretend, and how do we deal with that? Uh, there was a good article in America's Network, um, I forget the fellow's name, he looked at all the different booms in different industries, and the, the consensus was multiple booms are rare. So I don't think we can say that we're going to have another huge investment boom in telecom. And clearly if the boom ends before you reach economic self-sustainability, then you may have a problem. So there, there are a lot of huge issues in telecom, whether it's monopoly or competition. There's, a, there's always been this issue of uh, universal service, which becomes a subsidy type of an issue, uh, technical interoperability. All these issues are really behind broadband, it's very complex. Um, some countries are investing in research. The um, United Kingdom had a study where they actually found that the problem was not enough content. That's what they concluded. And so they're actually investing in developing content. I'm not sure if that study was right. It doesn't seem to me to, to ring quite true. Um, Ellie Noam has said, well, you've got uh, this WDM technology and it's costing N plus one guy so much less than end guy that you get this just natural inherent instability in the ability of carriers to deploy infrastructure and get return on investment. You didn't, you know, you used to have 40-year depreciation cycles, now you got five-year depreciation cycles. 
or less. And uh, so he, you know, he says, bring it back to monopolization, perhaps. And I'm saying, just sort of an offhand comment, it's occurred to me, but well, you know, it reminds me of the, what Alan Greenspan does. You know, if you've got something that sometimes you have too much and too little, you know, you don't just say, okay, you know, 1980, 19, Telecom Act, 92, this is what it's going to be, and then 10 years later you change it. Maybe there is a real role to have the, you know, the, the public utilities commissioners being a little bit more uh, uh, monitoring on a more incremental, temporal basis so that you really get a better um, outcome. So after all, there, there are huge sums that have been put to risk here, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, and some people have argued that the broader economic malaise of the country is a result of the telecom malaise, and that it's not going to be solved until that problem is solved. In other words, that some people have argued that the telecom problem, it's really not understood, and that the markets are understanding it to the degree that no one's investing in it anymore. All the dollars lost by investors as well as the, the, the bank loans means that the banks are hurting and everybody else is hurting, and that it's going to continue perpetuating until the telecom problem is solved. That's one person's take on it, Roxanne Gubin. So my voice here is saying, be cautious, governments, in terms of what you're doing, because if you decide to go into a business where we've already lost hundreds of billion, you know, what, what could it do to your, your cash flow? Again, reiterating the perspectives, the content community is saying, okay, folks in uh, Washington or Moscow or wherever, you know, we, we have to hold the, the manufacturers of electronics and the telecom companies accountable for every little copyright infringement. They're going out and they're suing everybody and their cousin that they can to try to stop what's, what's happening from the circumvention of the traditional delivery approaches where they monetize. And on the other side, the content community, more powerful in terms of the dollars coming in, but I don't know in terms of lobbyists, probably also more powerful. They're saying content always has and always should flow freely over these public networks and the liability is not an issue for uh, the operator or the manufacturer, it should be an issue for the end users. You know, it's not the gun that kills people, it's people that kill people. And um, I think they have a point. Regulations shouldn't limit computer capabilities which provide great value to individuals. In the content industry, we're so big, if you, you, know, if you side with the other industry, you know, you're going to kill an industry four or five times the size of it. So, so I, I would uh, tend to believe that once the telecom and technology and ISP industries get a consolidated fight against Hollywood, that Hollywood is going to have you know, a harder go at, at really making their arguments. Just a curiosity thing. Do you know whatever happened to that uh, RIAA honeypot that was set up? There was there were a bunch of ISPs that, if the RIA made good on their promise to come in and look around in their customers' machines for copyrighted materials they shouldn't have, they were going to uh, wreck havoc on it, wreck, well, destroy them, and and the. Uh, some ISPs were setting up a place that they would fake out the RIA. That you wouldn't be where you thought you were. You would not be in your customer's machine. You would be in their honeypot, and they'd be tracking what you're doing. A honeypot is something that's done in, in uh, firewalls to see how people behave or misbehave. So I, I, I knew about it about three months ago, but I haven't heard anything recently. I haven't heard of that specific okay. approach. But it was, was it the, uh, I forget the name, the name of the fellow who had the proposed amendment that would effectively enable RIA and others to... Yeah, yeah that was a, a California a legislator out of, uh, down in the L.A. basin, Hollywood Malibu, someplace, someplace like that, Malibu, I think, but anyway. To, to allow uh, them to write this, worms or was, something and destroy it, people's hard drives? Or something. <coughs> and it wasn't just that they could do that. But if they accidentally screwed up your computer, they weren't liable. Right, exactly. Whether you were 